Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin for our Wednesday evening Bible study. We're glad to have you with us. We are in Exodus chapter 11 tonight, so I want to invite you to be finding your own copy of the Bible. If you have the ability to do that, be joining us in Exodus chapter 11. We'll be there in a moment. If you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send a message to me at info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send me a text or make a call to 608-224-0274, and we'll try to have that information on the screen in just a moment. We are about to come to the end of the ten plagues tonight. God has told Moses to go to Pharaoh to demand that Pharaoh let his people go, the Israelites, releasing them from slavery, but of course Pharaoh is very stubbornly refusing to obey the Lord's command. And so in response, uh, God comes back with a series of plagues directly aimed at humiliating the various gods of Egypt. So, so far we've had the water turning to blood, we've had the plague of frogs, the plague of gnats, the plague of flies, the death of the cattle, the boils, the hail, the locust, and the darkness. And we've noted how each of these plagues was designed to embarrass the uh, major gods of Egypt. The first two were replicated by Pharaoh's magicians, but uh, by the third, the magicians admitted, this is the finger of God, we want nothing to do with this. Uh, the plague of flies only affects the uh, Egyptians, not the Israelites. That'll continue throughout the rest of the plagues. They only had to endure the first few. Uh, Pharaoh offers a compromise through several of the plagues, but Moses rejects all of these because that's not what God wanted. Uh, and generally speaking, just by way of review, Pharaoh's heart is hardened in this process. Initially, he hardens his own heart. There are few references to his heart being hardened without uh, specific reference as to who did it. Uh, but by the end, God is now described as hardening Pharaoh's heart. He's just helping him along in this direction that he's already going. So we've now had plagues one through nine. And tonight we are preparing the way for the tenth and the final plague. So we're not even going to get to the final plague, uh, but we have the setup for the final plague tonight. So let's jump back into it tonight with a lesson that's a lot, uh, I think, a lot shorter than some of the others that we've had. Just a, a, a short chapter tonight. So let's uh, continue with Exodus chapter 11, and we'll be looking at the first three verses. Exodus 11, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now the Lord said to Moses, one more plague I will bring on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out from here completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people that each man ask from his neighbor and each woman from her neighbor for articles of silver and articles of gold. The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Furthermore, the man Moses himself was greatly esteemed in the land of Egypt, both in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. And so according to God, this is it. This is, he's heading here to the last of the ten plagues. And I find it interesting that God hasn't said this before any of the other plagues. In other words, even going into the first nine, God knew beforehand that Pharaoh would not submit to each of these plagues. Or to put it another way, Nothing in this process is a surprise to God. Uh, years ago, uh, I was down south listening to a lecture from Brother John DeBerry, who's an interesting guy, a wonderful gospel preacher. And in the lecture that I heard him uh, teach that day, he said, Has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? That's an interesting statement. Nothing ever catches God by surprise. Oh, I've never thought about that before. No, God knew how Pharaoh would react. And so uh, now he's ready to bring this to a conclusion, and now he knows that this is it. So this is the conclusion. After this plague, Pharaoh will ultimately let the people go. And again, he never said that before the first nine. In fact, Pharaoh will not only let them go, but notice in this passage, he will drive them out of the nation. He will force them to leave. Uh, so he will not invite them to leave. He will force them to get out. Now, as they prepare for this, I, it's kind of interesting. God has a mission for the people. So this is... Uh, something that you need to do as a nation to prepare for this day to come. And so in verse 2, Moses is to very publicly explain that before they leave, each person is to just straight up ask their Egyptian neighbor for stuff that they can take with them. Anything made of silver and gold in particular. And notice this is not some kind of uh, a military conquest, but God is going to give the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. 
So as I understand this, the Egyptians basically uh, feel sorry for them. You know, all they want to do is leave. And, um, you know, the leader of the Egyptians is preventing the Israelites from leaving. And so they're getting these plagues in the process. And I think the Egyptians are basically thinking to themselves, let them go. Leave them alone. Just let these people leave. You know, maybe they can understand uh, that the Israelites have been abused for far too long. So there is certainly some sympathy going uh, uh, in place here. In addition to that, um, there are some perhaps who understand that it was their ancestor Joseph who saved the nation. I don't think that's completely lost to history. I mean, of course, Pharaoh didn't care about that, but certainly that is not uh, unheard of. People would have understood that. At least some people out there would have understood that. But for whatever reason, the Egyptian people, they pretty much take the side of the Israelites here. So uh, Pharaoh and the leadership, they are on a completely different page altogether. And then at the end of verse 3, we also find that Moses has earned some leadership credibility here. You know, Moses is greatly esteemed throughout the land of Egypt, uh, both in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, but also in the sight of the Egyptian people. And so the nation, it seems, is perhaps turning against their own king. And they're starting to take the side of Moses and the Israelite people. Remember, they've suffered some things, haven't they? I mean, the, the nation is absolutely devastated. And a certainly word got out as to why that is. So let's continue and see what happens next. This is Exodus chapter 11, and we'll be looking at verses 4 through 8. That's the next paragraph. Exodus 11, verses 4 through 8. Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I am going out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the millstones, all the firstborn of the cattle as well. Moreover, there shall be a great cry in all the land of Egypt, such as there has not been before and such as shall never be again. But against any of the sons of Israel, a dog will not even bark, whether against man or beast that you may know that you may understand how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel all these your servants will come down to me and bow themselves before me saying go out you and all the people who follow you and after that I will go out and he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger to me it's not clear that Moses is speaking to Pharaoh here at the beginning and until at the end but up in verse 4 Moses starts talking so he's talking to Pharaoh. We just kind of don't know that right now until verse 8. But here Moses is speaking for God, and he's telling Pharaoh what's about to happen. This is what's going to go down. And as we've noted, this one, like the others, is basically a natural event, isn't it? And I say that because people die all the time. But this is miraculous as to the scope and the timing of it. As to the scope of this plague, every firstborn in Egypt will die. That's very specific. And not only the firstborn in every family, but even the firstborn of whatever cattle might be left. So animals are even included here. So that's the first part, the scope of this. As to the timing of it, this will happen at midnight. So that's interesting. This is not random. This isn't spread over a period of weeks or days. But this is very specific, both in who will die and when they will die. This is not some random event. But when it happens, it will be catastrophic. And people will know exactly who is responsible for it because Moses has put this into words publicly right here before it happens, as he has with the other plagues, except for last, uh, the last one didn't uh, get a warning, but all the others, I believe, did. And notice, Moses also predicts the aftermath, doesn't he? At midnight, there will be a cry unlike any cry that's ever been cried. We can hardly imagine that. If we think just among those who may be watching on YouTube tonight, Quite a few of us would fit in that category of firstborn, wouldn't we? Who would die if all the firstborn died right now? My wife and I, for example, we're both the firstborn, as is one of our kids. And so out of our family of four, we would lose three of us. Three out of the four would be gone because three of us are firstborn. Our daughter would be the only survivor. Both of my parents are the firstborn in their families. So they would also be gone. And if we think about it for a second, the firstborn is obviously the most common birth order, isn't it? I mean, every family who has kids has a firstborn. Not everybody has a secondborn. I'm just saying that this is a widespread thing, and a lot of people were going to die that night all at the same time. 
And since Moses is announcing this, we might assume that the Egyptian people might revolt and, and take out their anger on Moses. You know, how dare you do this to us? However, notice how God says in verse 7 that against the sons of Israel, not even a dog will bark. So here I think we have the first reference to a dog barking in the Bible. Um, but having a beagle in our family, I do appreciate the fact that the dogs will not be barking at the Israelites. That right there would be a miracle in our family if the dog didn't bark at something. Um, so when the firstborn die, God's people will not be harmed at all. There will be this supernatural distinction between the Israelites and the Egyptians, and it will be incredibly obvious whose firstborn are dying. In verse 8, since this is God speaking through Moses, I'm thinking that the Egyptians will be bowing down um, to God, that seems to be the reference here. I'm open to the idea of them bowing down to Moses. Since he is God's spokesman, they'd be begging him. But either way, uh, the Egyptians will be begging the Israelites to leave. And then Moses says that he will leave. And at this point, Moses leaves the presence of Pharaoh. And, uh, and Moses is on fire. Moses is angry at this point. So uh, let's conclude tonight with Exodus chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. Exodus chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, so that my wonders will be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, yet the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the sons of Israel go out of his land. Well, after Moses leaves Pharaoh's presence, the Lord has another talk with Moses. And lets him know that Pharaoh will not be cooperating before the fact. He knows. He's not going to give in. But as terrible as it will be for Pharaoh, um, he will eventually submit unwillingly to God's plan. And God will be glorified. So he's going to submit. But now he really doesn't have much of a choice in the matter. And, and, that's, and that's all we have tonight. Um, we're kind of hanging there right before the final plague. It's been introduced, but it's not quite yet. I really don't want to go a few verses into the next chapter. Keep a clean break here at the end of chapter 11. And of course, last week I mentioned ahead of time that tonight's class would be be rather brief, and I, I certainly think that that's been the case. Uh, since we do have just a few minutes, I, I thought I'd arrange the plagues in chart form. Um, sometimes it's hard for me to get these straight especially since my Bible doesn't label them as plagues one, two, three, four, and so on. And so I've put them here listed in order, the left-hand column there of the plagues, with a few highlights or notes, kind of interesting uh, facts or tidbits on the right-hand column there. Feel free to screenshot this or take a picture of it if you can. I'd also be willing to uh, email it out if this helps, just kind of uh, my notes to help understand this. And notice up here on this little chart, I've noted that the first two were duplicated by the Egyptian magicians, while the third was declared by the magicians to have come from the finger of God, like, whoa, we can't do this. And uh, I've noted that the Israelites were exempted from the plague starting with the fourth one, and so that is significant. They are exempt from number four on. And um, I've noted that the magicians actually flee Pharaoh's court <laughs> during the plague of the boils number six that was kind of a neat thing <laughs> they had been duplicating these miracles and all of a sudden this one they're like we're out of here this is terrible we're not even going to be in the same room and they made a run for it uh, i've noted how pharaoh offers several compromises that are rejected by moses and then we have the tenth plague on here even though we haven't technically seen it yet um, but we're headed there over the next week or two but hopefully this chart is helpful in some way maybe i can bring that back next week but uh, let me know if you have any additions, any corrections. kind of hard to get all that stuff right on there. But if you have anything that needs to be added there, uh, let me know. And I'd be willing to update that before we come back together next week. But this brings us to the end of Exodus chapter 11. Uh, this Sunday, Caleb starts uh, leading us through a study of uh, random New Testament characters. That's what I'm calling it. Uh, the book that we're studying has a better description <laughs> than that. I think it sounds better. Uh, but we'll be looking at some people in the gospel accounts who are, I think, overlooked sometimes. And then we'll continue with Hebrews chapter 11 in the worship assembly. And we'll be looking at the faith of Moses this coming Lord's Day. Again, if you have any questions, any comments, concerns about tonight's class, some way we can help or something we need to be praying about, if there's some way we can encourage you, uh, get in touch. Send an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org. Send me a text. Give me a call at 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you. As we close tonight, let's all go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great God, the great King above all other gods, ruler of the nations. 
Thank you, Father, for demonstrating your power over an evil ruler, a very stubborn man. We pray that we would never harden our hearts as he did, but that we would always believe that you are and that you are a rewarder of those who look for you. We pray for courage as we do the best that we can to hold on to your word in a dark world. The world seems to press in on us sometimes, and we ask for strength to always do what's right. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. He came to this earth to save us. Thank you for everything that you've done. We come to you in his name. Amen.